I am tired. I don't know if you noticed that through my piano playing. I made a few mistakes, but uh, I'm worn out. But I'm blessed. I am truly blessed. This has been a wonderful week, hasn't it, guys? We had an amazing camp and completed 16 sites. And I will say, <clears throat> working in those camps this week, 16 sites with only 36 youth. And um, the majority of those youth, uh, 88% of, or no, yeah, 88%, no, 70% of them were from uh, middle school. 88% of them had never done it before. But working out there in that sun reminded me of how much I love air conditioning. I really love air conditioning. Thank you for air conditioning. But regardless of the struggles, Lives were changed last week. And, and I don't mean just the lives of the clients that we serve, but our lives were changed. My life was changed by that week. So it's my hope that just as my life has been changed by what happened last week, that the, maybe this message today might change your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are your church, and we meet here in your presence today to hear your word, that it will speak into our hearts, that it will mold us and shape us into the people that you are calling us to be, that we will examine our faith so that we may learn to be more like you, to be your disciples. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've got a confession to make, same confession I confessed in the first service. I chose this scripture, or I, 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 did, I chose this scripture not because of the, the theological implications of it, not because, of the, uh, because it was part of the, the lectionary schedule. I didn't choose it because it matched the theme of UM Army, even though I did preach on this uh, scripture that week, or last week. I chose this scripture because I thought... It might be easy to write a sermon on it because I was going to have a very busy week at UM Army, among other things that have been going on. Well, about a year ago, what makes this easier for me to preach on? About a year ago, I was sitting in the fellowship hall and, uh, with a member here discussing faith. And this scripture came up. We ended up talking about this for two hours, sitting in the fellowship hall, just he and I. We talked about it for two hours, and then when we finally finished the conversation, he told me I should write a book on it since I was so passionate about this scripture. I told him that he was ridiculous and that I didn't have nearly enough time to write a book. <laughs> well, a year later, I've got three chapters of this book written. <clears throat> so regardless... Because of all, all the research I've done on this scripture, I thought it would be easier to write a sermon about it. However, I certainly don't think that because it was easy to write that the sermon will be basic or boring. Because this scripture is captivating. There is so much in this scripture. And I don't mean the part about Jesus walking on water either. But quite frankly, if I saw Jesus walking on water, I would probably freak out. Would you freak out? See a guy walking on water? I mean, I, I would freak out about that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Peter. I'm talking about Peter. You know, so many times I've heard the scripture preached on and heard the message that uh, Jesus or that Peter sank in the water because he doubted. That, and that you should never doubt God because you might sink yourself. And, and the only way to save yourself is to call out to Jesus. And I'm not trying to diminish the exegetical work of others, uh, other pastors or theologians uh, that have done that work on the scripture. But, but I think that there's a message missing in there, a very important message. Something that we, we tend to overlook 
when we read this scripture. And that is Peter walked on water. Peter walked on water. I mean, raise your hand if you've ever walked on water. That's not walking. Not walking. You can get uh, do like Mythbusters did and get little pontoons and say you're walking on water, but you're not walking on water. The pontoons are floating. Raise your hand if you've ever seen somebody walk on water. So what was it that made Peter think that he could walk on water? He was a fisherman. His life was on the water. <clears throat> what made him think he could walk on water? And perhaps as I'm saying those words, you're thinking... Peter must have been crazy. He must have been a lunatic. I mean, and maybe you're right. Or maybe we're missing something that's not written in this narrative. What kind of faith does it take for a person to climb out of a boat in the middle of a raging storm? Anybody been on a boat in a storm? It's a lot like those hills that we drove through coming back from Athens. What made that person think that he could walk on the water? <clears throat> Let's start with the part where the disciple, uh, where, where the uh, disciple see Jesus walking toward them on the water. That's that's a pretty good place to start. And and on a side note, there Mark's gospel actually records that uh, Jesus was walking. Past them on the water. Matthew says he was walking towards them, but uh, Mark says he was walking past them. And um, to give you kind of reason why that might be the case, because I kind of lean towards Mark on this. What has happened before this, in the, uh, before this scripture, first of all, Jesus was in Galilee preaching and healing and stuff like that. Spent a whole day doing that, right? And he goes off. Uh, out of the city, whatever, and the crowd follows him. 5,000 people follow him. So he preaches to them some more, and then he's uh, trying, to, trying to leave and stuff like that, and the disciples say, hey, you need to dismiss them because uh, they're following you, and uh, they're hungry, and so you need to dismiss them to go back into the town so that they can get some food because otherwise it's going to be too late. And Jesus says, you feed them. And, and ends, up, ends up feeding 5,000 people with a couple of fish and loaves. And actually, it's probably more than 5,000 because when they counted people, they counted the men, unfortunately. So it may have been double, more than double than that. He does this, right? And then he tells his disciples, he says, you guys get in the boat and go on ahead of me. I'm going to dismiss this crowd. And then I'm going to go up into the mountain and pray. Jesus wants some time alone, right? So he sends the disciples out onto the water. And Jesus goes up the mountain. Now, what has this crowd done? They've already followed him out of the city. They, they, they stayed when it was time to eat. And, and all this is happening. So I can imagine that maybe these people followed him up the mountain, right? Or at least some of them. Jesus wants to be alone. So I, I can imagine, of course, this is not written. This is just me thinking about it. You can imagine Jesus like, where's a place I can go that they can't follow me? And he goes, walks out on the water. So whether he's going toward them or past them, Jesus was walking on the water, and that scared the poop out of the disciples. I'm going to use that word a lot more because of Chris. <laughs> Chris said, uh, 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 Chris was the... Uh, programs director up there, and he said, uh, "He said, be, lem be a lemon, don't be poop." And he says, "When you put when you put a squeeze of lemon into water, what does it do to the water? It makes it taste refreshing." So if you squeeze poop into a into water, what does it make it taste like? He said, "Don't be poop." But anyway, that was a sermon. But. So they see Jesus walking on the water, and they think Jesus is a ghost, and it scares them. And, and Jesus tells them not to be afraid, because that's what you do when you, uh, uh, when, you, when you scare somebody, right? Don't be afraid, it's just me. He assures them that it's him indeed. But that's not enough for Peter. 
I mean, quite frankly, if you saw, if I saw Chris walking out on the water to me, and he says, don't be afraid, it's me. I might be scared, right? I might not take his word for it, right? Peter doesn't take his word for it. Peter needs more proof. And, and kind of like Gideon here, he starts putting Jesus to the test. Uh, well, Gideon makes the angel do a bunch of tricks to prove that he's an angel. But listen how Peter makes Jesus prove himself to them. He says, Lord, if it is you, then tell me to come out onto the water. What? I mean, I mean how does that work? How, let's think about this. Evan, I'm going to use you. I know you, but let's pretend we don't know each other, okay? Who are you? Okay, if you're truly Evan, or, or how, uh, how, can I, how can you prove that you are Evan? You can show me his ID. Okay, you left it at home. What's another way you can prove it? Look at to your left and your right. He's Evan, right? And you look. So what, what you do is you get something or somebody else to prove it's you, right? All right, let's try this again. Who are you? No, no, I'm asking you. Who are you? You're Evan. Okay, if you're Evan, then tell me to fly around this room. Now, if I can't fly around this room, that means you're not Evan, right? That's ridiculous, isn't it? It's ridiculous for me to ask you to tell me to fly around this room and then that be the proof, right? So how is something that I'm going to do prove who you are? That's, that's essentially what, uh, what uh, Peter's asking Jesus. He's asking Jesus, if you're Jesus, then tell me to walk on the water. You know, that, that's ridiculous, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound ridiculous? So there must be something that we're missing, and in fact, there is. You know, I preached one time ago, uh, I think it was last year sometime, <clears throat> about a message that Rob Bell shared in his video series called NUMA. Now, if you've, I know you've all memorized all of my sermons, but in case you forgot about this one, I'll remind you about it. And what he was discussing was what it meant to be a disciple to a rabbi. Because what would happen uh, if you were born into a certain family uh, growing up, you would learn to be, do the work that your family does. That was your lot. So if you were a carpenter, you would grow up to be a carpenter. That's why Jesus was a carpenter. If, uh, if your parents were uh, uh, tax collectors, you'd be a tax collector. If your parents were garbage men, you'd be garbage men, you know. You learned to do what you did. But at the age of five years old, till the time they were 12, they would enter into a, a study program where they would learn to memorize the Torah. The Torah means the law or the way or the instruction. And I'm going to show you what that is. I kind of showed them this week. The Torah is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible right here. They would learn to memorize this by heart. Now, if you can imagine, not everybody was able to accomplish that, right? I mean, how many of you have the uh, Torah memorized? Alex, how much of the Bible you got memorized? Nah, not much. Okay. Don't worry about it. Well, what they would do is they would examine them and those that, that did a good job memorizing the, the Torah would move on. Those who didn't would go back and do their, their parents' work. Now, from the age of 12 to 16, those who were the best of the best, they would go on and they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew Bible. That's Genesis to Malachi, which is... I lost my card in there, but essentially about right here. Genesis to Malachi. By heart. And not only would they learn that, they would also learn, or they would uh, learn about the Talmud. And the Talmud was a bunch of <clears throat> writings that 
that informed them about the scriptures. It was interpretations of the writings. And the best of the best would have that memorized, but everybody else who was unable to do that would go back and do their father's work. But the best of the best would then be, have a chance to move on to the next level, which is to become a disciple to a rabbi. And what the rabbis would do is they would get together uh, all of these people and they would quiz them. They'd say, okay, uh, uh, tell me what uh, Genesis 12 says and read it to me. And then tell me what it means. And they would test them. And what they were doing is they were trying to see if this disciple could carry their yoke. Now, if, you're, if anybody's done farming or anything like that and knows what a yoke is, a yoke is what you would put on the, uh, the shoulders of an ox or a horse or, or a beast of burden to pull a plow or a wagon or whatever else, right? And the yoke symbolized uh, for a rabbi their understanding of Scripture, their burden to teach that. So that, that was their burden. And, and they were testing these people to find out if they could indeed carry that burden, if they can teach the scripture the way they teach it, if they can do what they do. And if they found some that they believe could carry their yoke, they would say, come follow me, be my disciple, because I believe you can do what I do. I believe you can learn to do what I do. That's going to be very important later. So what was Peter doing when Jesus called him? He was fishing. He was a fisherman. That means he wasn't following a, la a rabbi, was it? Right? That means he wasn't the best of the best. But Jesus comes up to him and calls him and says, you can do what I do. Be my disciple and come follow me. Peter wasn't good enough, but now he is called to be a disciple. Because Jesus believes what he can do. And these disciples, they, they had witnessed miracles of Jesus over the, over the time span. In fact, they had just witnessed Jesus feed 5,000 people. And they were currently witnessing Jesus walking on water. And when G Peter asks Jesus to prove to him that he is indeed Jesus, he says, if you are Jesus, if you are my rabbi, then call me out onto the water. Because if you are my rabbi, then I can do what you can do. And Jesus says, come. And Peter walks on water. Now Peter does begin to sink, right? He's walking on the water. I can just imagine this. He's walking on the water. And then it just realizes, I'm doing this. I'm walking on water. But remember, this isn't a calm sea. They're in the middle of a storm. And Peter sees the winds and the waves, and he begins to doubt himself, and he sinks. And he calls out to Jesus, and Jesus grabs a hold of his hand. And as he's pulling him out of the water, he says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? You have little faith, why did you doubt? You know, for the longest time, I thought that was Jesus criticizing him. Like, why do you have so little faith? But the more I, I read about this, the more I think that Jesus wasn't saying that at all. Because three chapters later in the scripture, in, the, in, in chapter 17, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can look at the mountain and tell it to move. And it will move. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that's a little bit of faith, right? He's not saying a mountain worth of faith. He's saying a mustard seed worth of faith. You can move a mountain. And so if Jesus is saying that little bit of faith can move mountains, he's saying to, uh, to Peter, you have little faith. And that's enough. That's enough faith to walk on water. How can... 
I mean, the only other person that's ever walked on water is Jesus. And, and, and Peter does this, and he walks on water, but he's got a little bit of faith. And that's what allows him to walk on the water. So the next question is, what about the other 11 disciples? Right? They saw Jesus walking on water. They see Peter walking on water. Where were they? Still in the boat. Doesn't that look like our church sometimes? You know, there's a saying in ministry that says uh, 2% of the church does 90% of the work. 2% of the church does 90% of the work. Now, that's not evenly distributed between churches, but, but it says something. I think this scripture says something, because there were 12 disciples, and 11 of them were still in the boat, watching Peter do the work. And I know, we have excuses why we can't do it. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know enough about the Bible or I might say something wrong or I might do something wrong. I might mess it up. Other people will take care of it. That's not what I'm called to do. We like to stay in our boat, don't we? Eighty-eight percent of that camp last week had never been to UM Army. I've served 11 UM armies. That was the smallest camp I've ever served. And they built more wheelchair ramps than any other camp I served. Most of them didn't know what they were doing. Alex, you ever built a wheelchair ramp? How many days did it take you to build that wheelchair ramp? One day. How many people were new on your team? All but two. He had a total of eight people on his team. All but two. He did it. They got out of the boat. You know, we can do miracles. Jesus called us to be his disciples. And that means that Jesus believes that we can do what Jesus does. That we can move mountains. That we can walk on water. This week at UM Army, we helped 16 clients. 16 of them. You know, the client that had the smallest ramp that weekend had the biggest mobility issue. He was literally trapped in his house unless somebody could lift him out of it. Then our team came and built this little ramp so he can get out of his house. They moved a mountain from that guy's life. They gave him freedom. And there's 15 other stories just like that. So the question for us today is, what do we do? Do we stay in the boat? Watching others do the work of the church? Or do we take our little faith, climb out of this boat we're in, and walk on the water? Go into the community and move mountains. Just like we did last, last week. We can do it. We are the church. And we can give God all the excuses in the world because we're not experienced or we don't know what we're doing or whatever the excuse is. But God can work miracles through you. And we saw that this week. So get out of the boat. Be the church. Amen. Let us pray.